is the first time I've seen this picture. This is the man who fathered my children. You meet a guy, you fall in love with him. You know, he can tell you the sky is pink and you go, yeah, it is. And you know it's blue. But you go along with it because you're in love with this guy. And you feel like he wouldn't do anything to put you in any harm's way. Whatever I did feel for this man, it doesn't exist anymore. That died a long time ago. The whole time I was looking at him, I was just thinking, can I reach him? Can I get to him before they get to me? How much damage can I do if I do get to him? Will it be enough to end his life? Two seconds, that's all I need is two seconds. And I'm willing to go to jail for that because I have nothing to live for. I hope you're right now.
I had no way to warn my mother because there were no cell phones back then. So I couldn't call and divert them. Where's your name, George? They came and they knocked and they knocked and they knocked and I wasn't allowed to open the door and let them in. Reggie, um... Don't. Please. It felt like an eternity to me that my mother and my uncle were standing on the porch knocking on the door to get in knowing that I should be there. Reggie, Reggie, I, I need to answer the door. This is very strange. And I and I wasn't any there and just hoping that, you know, eventually that they would stop knocking and just go home. I was very young and very naive to a lot of things. I was a little too embarrassed to even go over there even later on and, you know, even try to explain anything because I was just like, wow, what do I say? You know. That was just that, that one time and after that, if anybody were to come around or come to visit, whatever, I just go to her house. It just made it easier. If he didn't want to go, that's fine, but we're going. You know, you don't want to participate in anything, that's fine, we're going. So it never happened again. He was a loner, and I kind of respected that, but then he started not wanting to do too much. He stopped going out of the house. Now you can't catch me. <laughs> he wouldn't go anywhere. He wouldn't go to the store with me. He wouldn't go to anybody's home with me. If we were invited anywhere, he didn't want to go. Fred, you want to come into town with us? We're going to go to the movies. So I hang on here for a little bit. He didn't want to be around his family. He didn't want to be around my family. He would sit on the porch and he would watch the kids play and then eventually he stopped even sitting on the porch and he just stayed in the house. I didn't perceive that as being strange. He just was a recluse. You know, he just got to the point that he didn't he didn't want to associate or he disassociated himself from the outside world. That's how I perceived it. It's like, okay, this is how you want to live, or this is how you want to be. That's that's on you, you know, but we're not going to stay locked up in this house. You know, we're going to do what we do on a daily basis. If you're content to sit in here, then that that's what you do. in him. I had made this beef stew. Me not eating with them was not unusual because if I'm making sure everybody is fed, I'm doing stuff. But he wasn't feeling all that great and he was he was sick. Beverly? Yeah, babe? And then he comes in there like, I've done something. What are you trying to do? You better tell me what's in this. Okay, and don't, don't you play stupid and accused me of putting stuff in his food. What are you talking about? He said, what'd you put in the food? And I said, seasoning, what I always do. Are you okay? I don't know why you would think I would do something like that. Where would I even get poison? Stop denying it. That's why you haven't eaten any of the stew. Come on, the kids ate it too. Do you really think I would poison my own children? Prove it. What? I said prove it. He it's like, well, I need you to eat it. Eat a bowl right now. Fine. I'm like, okay, I don't have a problem eating it. So I did, and he stood there while I ate it. And I ate it. See? Nothing wrong with me. I don't know 
know why you're feeling this way. I don't know why you're sick. Has nothing to do with your food. Reggie, you really don't look so well. He still wasn't feeling any better. So I finally convinced him to go to emergency because I don't know what's going on. And he had appendicitis. They took him straight in and took him up and they said he had a half an hour to live before he would have died from from it rupturing. And if I had not made him get in that car, he would have died. All I had to do was wait a half an hour. I'm sitting there and I'm looking at him and I tell him, I will kill you. Got it? And if you think I'm kidding, try me. In the middle of the night, 
I woke up to smelling smoke. So I got up to see, and it was inside the house, in the kitchen area. So I went in there to see what was going on. And I had a rag doll. It was an ornament that you hang on the wall. And he had laid it on the stove and turned on a very low flame and set the doll on fire. I don't think it had been on there very long. It was just on there long enough to cause smoke because all I had to do was take it off and put it under some water and it was under control. Reggie, why would you put this on the stove? You could have burned down the whole house. He was in bed when I woke up to the smoke. He had gone in there and done that and got back in bed. I'm like, you know, what is wrong with you? Why would you turn the stove on and we're all sleeping? Why would you do something like that? Reggie, please answer me. I can't help you if you don't talk to me. But I just never got any response as to why. So it's like beating a dead horse. So why keep asking the same question if you're not going to get an answer? I had to let it go. But that made me more on my toes of, okay, now I got to beware that you might go in there and put something on the stove. I don't know what. something because I don't know what to do. 
child. I sent the kids to their room and I called the police.
and he went back to bed. Reggie, living room, now! They've done nothing wrong. They've never been disrespectful. They never even talked back to him. What is going on, Reggie? No, I'm not going back to bed, because I can't trust him to not go back in there. Why would you do this? Okay, so now you're taking sides. That's I'm not is. taking sides, but this is unacceptable. That boy got exactly what he had coming to him. So, I said, I don't know what he did or didn't do in your mind's eye, but I will tell you this. I'm not playing games anymore. You understand? He's my child. And if you ever, ever put your hands on my son again like that, I will kill you. And if you think I'm kidding, try me. I never... He used to kind of help them with their homework and stuff. And why is that one blank? Having study sessions at the dining room table. And I just go around the table. Who needs help with what? Reginald said something to Vaughn, and Vaughn said something back to him. What did you say to me? I said... <clears throat> and, um, he smacked him. Reggie smacked Vaughn. He smacked him in the face. Stop! You get off of him! I jumped up, and I went and got in between them, trying to pull him apart. Get off of him! So, Reginald Sr. smacked me. Mom, are you kidding? It's not all for him. It's not. And the next thing I know, Reginald Jr. was on top of Reginald Sr. Oh, it's not worth it. Get off the go. And then Vaughn, all they were trying to do was wrestle him down to keep him from hitting anybody. Everything was over. All I could, you know, hear my husband say was, you know, you're dead meat. Y'all dead meat. You're dead meat. You shouldn't have done that. That's the final straw. I'm done with it. And him jumping on the kids like that. I'm not having this. I'm not subjecting them to this. They didn't do anything to deserve any of this. I'm done. You think you're done, Reggie? This is over. I told Reggie that I'm getting a divorce. I can't do this anymore. We already have a place, so you're the one that needs to go. Here, here's some money for you, traveling money. Go as far as it'll take you. Bye. And he didn't. He didn't leave. He never went anywhere. And I told the kids, I said, okay, from now on, when you go to school, do not come home till you know that I'm home from work because I can't protect you if I'm not here. I do know that in my mind, I felt like, okay, once I get this divorce, you definitely have to go because you can't stay delivered. But I didn't know that they were delivered. He never said anything to me. I think he thought that I was not going to do that. At that point, things had kind of calmed down. We hadn't had any other incidents. When I left work, I was going to go do something else, and I don't remember what that was. But I, in a voice, go home. This voice, go home, go home. And, um, so that's what I did. I went home. We had a little dog, Cotton, and uh, he didn't come to the door. The house was quiet. There was some music on, but it was really, really low. I thought, well, maybe Reggie was listening to it, but didn't hear him, didn't see him. He wasn't anywhere in the house. So... 
I decided that um, I needed to check on the kids and see what they're doing and get them something to eat. Well, their door to the bedroom was closed. So I opened the door. You know, I saw one in the bed. I said, oh, them sleepy heads, they're still in the bed. Boys? Come on now with the games. I said, hey, sleepy heads, y'all need to get up. It's, it's in the afternoon. You done slept all day. What's up? Nobody was responding. So then I go in the room. And Reggie Jr.'s arm is up like this. You know, and I'm looking. And then that's when I saw the bullet hole in his head. I heard somebody scream, but I don't know who it was. But in actuality, it was me. And then I looked up, and then I saw Vaughn had a bullet hole in his head. I think everything was surreal then. I turned around, and I looked at the articles. I pulled the covers back. I saw his brains everywhere, and I just lost it. I'm not going to make it. supposed to be doing, but you don't want me to know what it is. This is Vaughn, my second oldest. He was the shy one. He was always keeping his hair so neat, and then it didn't take but a little bit of wind, it would be all over the place. This is my mischievous one. This is Niarcos, and you can tell by that smile bad, but he was always doing something. It makes me sad to think about them and that I can't hold them. It's very, very painful. 
and it's something that you never get over. I didn't know where he was. He had a gun and probably still had it. So if he could get close enough in the proximity of where I am, I could be next. My now brother-in-law uh, sat there with a shotgun, literally across his knees until they found Reggie. on the door said it's police can we come in he had been captured and they were bringing him back and he was in utah i don't know where he was going they told me that he had two baggage claim tickets but he was only claiming one suitcase he did not indicate that there was another bag that had been checked um, under the bus and that's where the gun was i want to see him he claims to this day that he didn't do it, but who else? Who else would? Who else would have have a reason to? Is that correct, ma'am? He's sitting there. I'm looking at him. Yeah. Then I'm answering questions. Yes, that's correct. But the whole time I was looking at him, I was just thinking, can I reach him? Can I get to him before they get to me? You know, how far away is he really? You know, how much damage can I do if I do get to him? It, will it be enough to end his life? Give me the opportunity to get to him for two seconds. That's all I need is two seconds. And we won't have to have a trial. We won't have to have anything. And I'm willing to go to jail for that because I have nothing to live for. When I heard that he had been found guilty and was sentenced to death, I had a sense of relief that I would have justice for my voice. This is the shirt um, that I had on. We wore it in hopes that if Reggie would see us, he would see these shirts and he would know that we were there supporting that justice was finally being done for these boys. We took our seats and we um, just kind of held each other's hand, you know, and just sat there and waited. The um, warden did ask him, did he have any last words? And he said no. But one of the last gestures that he made was to stick up both middle fingers and that was his message and made a very hard conscious effort to make sure that they remained up throughout the whole ordeal. So we just kind of just sat there and, you know, being come, trying to stay composed. That was the longest 10 minutes of my life. was over. Finally, you get to know what it feels like not to draw another breath. And you don't get the chance to hurt anybody else ever again. And hopefully you'll rest in hell.
when it was very, very raw. I was very, very angry. And so I lashed out, you know, at people that really didn't deserve it. I had to learn how to stop doing that. I did meet someone I never thought I would. I met him the same year that I lost my children. And then I started dating him the year after. We were together 34 years before he passed. He has her still in my life today. So that in itself has also helped me to get through the last 30, 36 years. But I don't think you ever cry enough. These are the headstones. I wanted miracles in the middle so his brothers could protect him. The inscription up there is always on our minds, forever in our hearts. My babies, I wouldn't wish this on anybody. I wouldn't want anybody to go through what I've gone through. So anyone that you care about or love, tell them as often as you think about it that you love them. Give them a hug. Never take for granted that they're always going to be here because that's not true.